Hello, my name is Allison and I'm a volunteer. Here at Arlington Countryside Church, we believe that wherever you are in your faith journey, you can experience new life through Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us today. Somewhere on the screen where you are watching this, you will see a link to a communication card. Go ahead and fill that out. On the communication card, there's an area where you can indicate if you have any prayer requests or praises, and you can make those public or indicate that they're private and confidential. And that will be for the staff and elders only. Also, if you're a parent and you are not receiving children's resources and would like to, please check that box on the communication card as well. Finally, if you're new here, there's a box for you to check that says, I'm new here. So go ahead and check that and we'll be sure to get you some more information to get you connected here at ACC. We have an event coming up here on Halloween, October 31st, called Trunk or Treat. It's going to take place in the church parking lot, and it's an event that's gonna be a lot of fun if you want to attend with children, a way for you to get candy, socially distant, wearing masks. Also though, it is a way that if you'd like to volunteer and serve, there are a lot of ways that you can do that. So please go to acchurch.org slash events to learn more.
The pedal belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet I sing through the night Oh God, the pedal belongs to you yes. And oh God, the pedal belongs to you How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountains I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night then through the darkness, your love and kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken I am forgiven Woo! The King of Kings calls me His own Beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ My living hope Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free
It was a few years ago that I was backpacking on the Appalachian Trail in North Carolina. And on this particular day, I was excited because I was climbing a mountain, I was climbing a peak that was known to have an unbelievable view. It was supposed to be just breathtaking. And so I was looking forward uh, to seeing that view. I had heard so much about it. Um, as I was beginning the trek up the mountain, I passed a couple of hikers who were descending. They were coming down as I was going up, and they talked about uh, what an incredible view it was, and they just heightened my anticipation of, of seeing that. Uh, but then one of the guys said to me, he goes, but you need to know, man, you've got a rugged hike ahead of you. Um, it gets really hard. And in fact, you'll be on your hands and knees by the time you get to the top. And I was like, be on my hands and knees by the time I get to the top? What does that mean? I mean, how hard can it be? But he kind of struck some fear in me, right? And I kind of changed my mindset in that, okay, this isn't a, a stroll in the park. I've got some tough uh, climbing ahead of me here and I better be ready for it. And it wasn't um, until the very top, like the last eighth of a mile, maybe quarter of a mile, it got so steep and it got so rocky that he was literally right. I was literally on my hands and knees grabbing rocks and moving from one place to the other uh, to go up to the top. And yeah, it was extremely difficult climbing, especially when you got 30, 40 pounds on your back. Um, uh, as an aside, uh, uh, two things. One was, uh, as I began uh, the last part of the climb, it began a torrential downpour. And so not only was I on my hands and knees picking my way across the rocks, but I was doing it in a torrential downpour. And it was like a waterfall, the, the water coming uh, down the mountain. Uh, it, was, it was crazy, it was absolutely crazy. But then the other thing was, when I finally got to the top, when I got to the summit, couldn't see a thing. The clouds were so thick that there was virtually no scenery, no view to look at it at all. Um, and so this thing I looked forward to for so long, it just didn't happen. But I got to tell you that even though I didn't like that hiker telling me there was some rough road ahead, that there was some difficulty ahead, it's not news you want to hear, right? I, I didn't like being told that. But on the other hand, ultimately, it was helpful because it changed my mindset. And when I, when, when I got to that difficult section, I wasn't thrown off. I wasn't psyched out. I, I knew it was coming, and I was kind of prepared for it mentally. Well, being warned that difficulty is ahead, again, isn't really what any of us want to hear but ultimately it can be helpful for us dealing with situations we find ourselves in. And in today's um, section of scripture that we're looking at in 2 Timothy, Paul is giving a heads up to Timothy about some difficult days ahead. And uh, so in that sense, very much you and I are given the same warning. Uh, check out uh, this 2 Timothy 3 verse 1, the warning of difficult days ahead the warning of difficult days ahead. Verse one says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. Very difficult times. That same Greek word used here is used in Matthew chapter eight to describe um, two demon-possessed men. And there, that phrase is translated violent, violent. Here, it's very difficult. There, it was translated violent. And so this idea is a very strong one that Paul is communicating to Timothy. And it's the idea of synonyms would include dangerous or savage or violent, uh, something very hard to deal with. And so straight up, Paul is telling Timothy, you've got some really difficult times ahead of you. It's going to be savage. So he speaks of these as being during the last days. The last days. 
That phrase, last times, last days, is a phrase used in the New Testament. And basically, it describes the period of time in between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. You and I are living in the last days. Timothy was living in the last days. And in phrasing it this way, um, it gives an important eschatological um, perspective to the age in which we live. It's that period of time between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. And during that period of time, it's going to be some hard times. There's going to be some difficulties. Um, and what's important to realize is that in spite of the difficulties, God's ultimate purposes are being worked out. These difficult days aren't a surprise. They were predicted. And so we need to understand that God is still in control. We live in a world where it can seem very chaotic and very wicked, and it can be kind of scary, kind of intimidating, and yet we got to remember, this was all predicted. This was all predicted. This isn't catching God by surprise, and it shouldn't catch us by surprise because we've been warned ahead of time. And so uh, you think of a verse like Jude uh, chapter 1, verse 18. It said, they told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. And so the last days are marked by people who are rebelling against God and scoffing at God and scoffing at his people and uh, just seeking to fulfill their own desires. So I want you to see now, we're going into this next section where it describes the qualities that, 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 that mark the people of this generation, um, the evildoers. And the qualities we're about to read, they're not exclusive just to the last days. As part of the fallen human race, these qualities have always been around, okay? But what scripture does seem to indicate is this that depravity will increase in scope and in intensity nearer to Christ's return. It's kind of like the heat being turned up, the volume being turned up more and more, the closer it gets to Christ uh, returning to earth. And so check out the description of moral depravity. The description of moral depravity as we find in verses 2 through 5. For in these difficult times, right, it says, For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. As I was reading this list and thinking about it, I was thinking to myself, it sounds like the Apostle Paul uh, logged in the Facebook and spent a little bit of time reading all the various posts and all the comments to the posts. Uh, and so this description should resonate with us. Uh, I think this is very much the world in which we live. Honestly, most of the qualities, uh, the traits being described here are pretty self-explanatory, right? And so I'm not going to take the time to focus in on each one. And in fact, what I like to do with a list like this, this is a list of evil, right? And to think about what it means to be Christ-like in our world, all we've got to do is find the antonyms for each of these. Just go with the opposite of these words, and you find a description of Okay, this is the way that you and I, who are followers of Christ, this is the way that we should be living. And so you look at the list, and it says, you know, we, if we were to turn it on its head, we'd be saying, hey, we should love others and not be attached to, to um, possessions. Uh, we should be humble, and, and, and we should um, 
worship God. We should obey our parents. We should be thankful for all things. We should, we should consider sacred things sacred. We should be loving. We should forgive others. We should build up others up with our speech, and we should have self-discipline, and so on and so on like that. Um, now, I want you to see that what I do want to focus on, on the specifics of this list is the first thing mentioned and the last thing mentioned, because the list is bookended with misplaced love. Misplaced love. Paul is using a common writing technique here um, that when in, in ancient writing, when a list was, was um, a part of a narrative, part of a story, typically for emphasis sake, what they would do is pay special attention to the first thing on the list and the last thing on the list. We'll look again at those, verse, at those verses. The, the first thing on the list was people will love only themselves and their money. And then the last thing mentioned was they will love pleasure rather than loving God. These are descriptions, examples of misplaced love. First of all, they love only themselves. It's not natural for us to love God as a fallen human race, but it is natural for us to be very self-centered and self-focused and to look out for ourselves, look out for number one, to love ourselves. Now, I've heard people say sometimes, well, you can't properly love God or you can't properly love others until you love yourself. You got to learn to love yourself first and then maybe, maybe you can then branch out and love other people or learn to love God. Now, you know, that has a ring of, um, yeah, that makes sense. That has a ring of reasonableness to it until you realize that thinking like that flies directly into the face of what Scripture teaches. It directly contradicts Scripture because Scripture warns against being lovers of self and prioritizes that the most important thing you can do is love God and love others. That's what we're called to focus on, love God and love others. And here's what I want to suggest. When we put first things first and we follow God's commands, we learn to have a positive self-esteem. I think it's important as human beings that we accept ourselves. I think we see ourselves when we are in Christ as his beloved, that we see the inherent dignity and value we have being created in the image of God. And so God doesn't call us to a worm theology where we hate ourselves and we talk bad about ourselves all the time and we think we have nothing to offer the world. And that's not what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, the truth is God wants to use you to make a difference. And God wants you to see yourself as a beloved child uh, when we are in Christ and to see ourselves as being people made in the image of God. But our goal should never to be to love ourselves. It should be to love God, love others. And that then that self-acceptance will be built into our lives as we get in touch with God. But never mistake this truth that we find fulfillment and wholeness in Christ. You don't find fulfillment and whole, wholeness in finding yourself, right? That's not where it comes from. It comes from being connected with God through Christ, and then life starts to make sense and we can gain proper priorities. Uh, but a misplaced love is a love that loves only yourself. But also it speaks of that they love only their money. This is an issue, especially in Western culture. We are so materialistic. We are so wealthy compared to the vast majority of the rest of the world. And it's easy for us to become attached to physical things and to have an over-dependence upon money. And what ends up happening is we take the focus off our creator and put it onto creation. We forget about the giver and we start focusing instead upon the gifts. And so it's a danger and it can derail a person's life to become materialistic and to love money. And it's a reminder to us that contentment, contentment and true happiness is never found in things, never found in possessions. You can ask King Solomon that. You remember the ancient uh, king of Israel, Solomon, his story in the Old Testament? Uh, it, he had everything you could possibly imagine. He was the richest person in the world, and yet 
in his journey, what he found was this, that it doesn't satisfy, that it's vanity, that, that, that you don't find the happiness you think you would find if you had everything you could dream of. Solomon would say, don't trust in money, don't look to it for happiness. And so in these last times, these difficult days, people will love only themselves, they'll love only their money. And then uh, he bookends the list by ending by saying, uh, they love pleasure rather than loving God. That loving pleasure lifestyle, and I think part of loving pleasure is avoiding pain at all costs, right? And that loving pleasure avoiding pain is what's also known as hedonism. It's a lifestyle that's very, very self-centered, and it's all about me, it's all about taking care of myself and doing whatever makes me happy. Have you heard that advice? Hey, do whatever makes you happy. That's hedonism, right? That's hedonism right there. And I want you to understand that God wants us to enjoy life. And so what we're not talking about here is it's not a choice between pleasure or God, but that true pleasure is found in God. I love Psalm 16, verse 11. Check it out. It says, uh, you will show me, speaking to God, it says, you will show me the way of life granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. And so there's really a, a type of hedonism. I think John Piper, uh, a well-known pastor and author, for, uh, uh, coined the phrase Christian hedonism. And it's the idea that true pleasure is found in a personal connection with God because then you find real meaning, real purpose, you find lasting contentment, and it's extremely pleasurable life. But it's not pleasure found in sin or self-centeredness, but it's found in worshiping God that allows you to then love others, and it's a very fulfilling life. Know this, that God loves you, and God desires a relationship with you. And that emptiness that people try to fill with loving themselves, with possessions, loving money, loving pleasure— that emptiness a person feels inside of them will never be filled by misplaced love. That hole is filled by love that is directed in the right direction, and that is towards God. Coming into a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ, developing a relationship with him, learning to love him, learning to worship him, that's where that hole is filled in our hearts. It begins there. Now, what's interesting in the passage of Scripture we're looking at today, there's only one command in the nine verses we're looking at. There's only one imperative, and it's this. Stay away from people like that. After this description um, that he gives of these type of people, he says, stay away from people like that. That's a command given to us. Now, on the surface, it can seem kind of problematic, right? Because it seems to be contradicting other passages of Scripture. For instance, just previously, near the end of chapter 2, look at these words. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. So you see here, Paul seems to be advocating that you and I should be thoughtfully engaging people and that we should be civil and gentle and that we need to be interacting with them, helping them to come to a knowledge of the truth. And yet, we just read uh, here in chapter 3 where he says, stay away from people like this. So how do we reconcile this seeming contradict contradiction? A few things to keep in mind, I think, when we think about our focus on chapter 3 and the people being described in chapter 3. First of all, these are hardcore, unrepentant people. 
These aren't people who just occasionally do this or that, but they have a committed lifestyle of evil. They're the hardcore unrepentant. Probably not very often, typically, the person you'd find as your neighbor, though that could easily be. The other thing to keep in mind is that Paul likely maybe had in mind that he, the, the people he were describing were teachers. They were false teachers and preachers, and therefore they needed to be avoided because of how uh, such a bad influence that they could have. But the other thing I think that's true is that Paul could have been speaking about those who are within the church that these were religious people. These were people who uh, were trying to pass themselves off as one of God's people, when in fact their lifestyle and their conduct uh, contradicted that claim. I want to take you to a passage of Scripture just real quick in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 9. This is pretty interesting stuff. It says, When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it, it is certainly, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. Isn't that fascinating? God wants you to love and be building relational bridges with those who don't know him. And it's a great reminder to us, you can't expect unbelievers to act like believers. And so that kind of behavior that he's talking about, of course you're going to see that in those who don't know God. They don't know any better. They can't help themselves. And so there's no, there's no prohibitions against spending time with them and reaching out to them and engaging with them and, 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 and seeking to love them, right? God doesn't have a problem with that. Somebody's got to reach them. We're called to reach them. Paul said... My emphasis, you misunderstood what I'm saying, is the person you, you need to confront, the person you need to judge, is the person in the church. The person who's claiming to know God, claiming to be religious, and yet they're living a wild lifestyle. That's the person you've got to avoid. Because they can negatively influence you, because they, they use their faith in Jesus Christ as a license for all kinds of sin, and it's wrong. We shouldn't act, expect unbelievers to act like believers, but we sh also shouldn't expect believers to act like unbelievers. When believers act like unbelievers, that's a problem. And in the church, that needs to be confronted. That needs to be dealt with. Now, again, I'm not talking like in a super judgmental way, a super harsh way. But it shouldn't be tolerated. It shouldn't be tolerated, and people should be called out, right? Right? Uh, using the guidelines of Scripture uh, should be done privately. It should be done lovingly and gently. But nevertheless, it shouldn't be sloughed off. It shouldn't be ignored, but it should be challenged. Because if a person claims to be like Christ, they shouldn't be living like the rest of the world. Lastly, the last, last section I want you to see here in our last few minutes is the example of creepy counterfeit teachers. The example of creepy counterfeit teachers beginning at verse 6. They are the kind who work their way. And other versions say worm their way. I love that. They are the kind who worm their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they are never able to understand the truth. These teachers oppose the truth just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith, but they won't get away with this for long. Someday, 
everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Janus and Jambres. The situation that Paul describes here is probably a real life example. He probably had specific people in mind here, people that Timothy was familiar with, that he was familiar with. It, it was like a, um, uh, you, know, you know, like a case study kind of thing. And these false teachers were sneaky. They were manipulative. They were working their way into people's homes, seeking influence. They were worming their way in, and they were seeking to win the confidence of people, uh, taking people captive, uh, people who had confidence in them when they shouldn't have had confidence in them. And you see, he says many things about these false teachers. He says, first of all, that they're posers, that their faith is counterfeit. Don't think for a second they're really believers. They're not. It's a counterfeit faith that they ultimately really have depraved minds. Another thing he says about these false teachers is that they were purposeful. They were strategic. They were were very covert in nature, and they were targeting the vulnerable. And I want you to understand in this passage of Scripture, nothing is being implied here that all women are like these women or that men are not susceptible to being deceived. That's not what's being said, right? Uh, It's simply an example of some women that were known who were being taken in by false teachers because of their vulnerability. And false teachers have radar for vulnerable people. They groom vulnerable people. They can spot them from a mile away and they target in on them, they hone in on them to gain a following with them, to take their money from them. That's common. In our day, it was common back then. Now, what made these women vulnerable specifically? I don't really know. We can only speculate. It could have been that they were widows and no one was more uh, vulnerable in first century uh, world than, than a widow, someone who didn't have anyone taking care of her and didn't have a means of support. They might have been vulnerable because they were rich. They were from a rich family. And so these charlatan preachers were trying to get their money from them. We don't know. But for whatever reason, they were vulnerable. The other thing is that these false teachers are likened or compared to Janus and Jambres. Now, who in the world is Janus and Jambres? If you do a search of scripture, you don't find these names anywhere. It's like, who are these guys? Well, what we know from historical records is that according to Jewish tradition, Janus and Jambres were the two sorcerers of Pharaoh. When Moses faced off with Pharaoh. You remember and Moses threw down his staff and it turned into a snake. And then Pharaoh brought out his sorcerers and they threw down their staffs and their staffs turned into snakes. Those sorcerers were Janus and Jambres. And so Janus and Jambres ultimately became symbols of anyone who opposes God's truth. And so uh, Paul is saying that these false teachers are like Janus and Jambres. They oppose the truth of God, but their fate is going to be the same as Pharaoh's sorcerers, that ultimately they're going to be shown to be false teachers. They will eventually be exposed, if not in this life, then in the next. Well, what are the implications for us in this teaching for today? I want to give you two quick application points. The first is this. Don't get freaked out by the evil around you. So many times I hear Christians who are alarmists and they're they're like always flipping out about what's going on around them and they're fearful and they're intimidated and they're chicken little, you know, running around, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and they act like uh, it caught them by surprise. Understand we've been warned. Don't let it shake you, okay? I thought of a hymn from uh, my childhood that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, It's a song, This Is My Father's World. Do you know it? And there's a verse in this hymn that goes like this. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. And so we might live in dark times, but folks, 
Don't be intimidated. Don't forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. He's still in control. And so we don't have to back down. We back down. We don't need to turn our backs and run. We don't need to be intimidated. The second implication, the application point for us today is this. Not only should you not get freaked out by the evil around you, but don't get sucked in by the world around you. Don't be deceived. Don't become like others around you. Don't get sucked into the evil. Uh, we are called to live a lifestyle like Jesus lived. We are to do as he did. We're to follow in his footsteps. And so the way we live our, our lives should be distinctly different from those who don't know God. And I want to encourage you, don't get sucked in by the evil, right? Don't fight fire with fire. Don't go down to other people's levels, but rather live a life that's focused on loving God, on loving others, and understand that we are more than conquerors, all right? We are more than conquerors. We don't need to give in the fear. We don't need to be intimidated. I want to encourage you, stay on mission. Keep loving God. Keep loving others. The creator of the universe is with you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you've given us the warning. We understand. And God, we experience it. We see it all around us. And Lord, help us to not be afraid. Help us to not back down. God, by your grace, help us to stay on mission. Father, we ask that you would strengthen our faith, that in these difficult times we would stay strong, that you would help us by your grace and by your mercy to always remain faithful to you. Lord, help us to love those around us. Help us to make a difference in our world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I searched the world It couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures the faith Never enough Then you came along And put me back together Every desire Now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing A better than you, Lord, there's nothing And nothing is better than you Oh Here we go I'm not afraid To show you my weakness And flaws, Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
worship through song and through hearing a message from God's word, we are now going to continue and worship through the act of giving. Your financial contributions are very much appreciated. There are a few ways that you can go ahead and do that. You can go to acchurch.org give, or there will be a link somewhere on the screen where you can give. You could also mail a check to the church if you would like. Please join me now as we go ahead and pray together for the offering. Dear God, we acknowledge that everything we have has comes from you. Everything, breath, food, shelter, everything. And as we give, we acknowledge that we are giving back to you just a portion of what you've given to us. Lord, we pray that you would bless the money that's given, that it would be used to advance the kingdom of God, to show love to others here in the community and around the world. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now receive the benediction from 2 Timothy 4.22. May the Lord be with your spirit, and may his grace be with all of you. Go in peace and serve him.